Coming up, China launches Long March 5. Cygnus rides an atlas. I interview Jim Cantrell, the CEO of Vector Space Systems. All that and more coming up on this week's episode of Tomorrow. Welcome to Tomorrow 9.36. Oh, it's hard to believe we've gotten that many shows this season so far. It's really amazing. And at first, I want to give a shout out to all of our Patreon premiere members. These are the people who are giving us $10 or more per episode, which is really fantastic. Thank you so much for all of your support. It's been a really great ride so far. So to get us started, first of all, I am Carrie Ann Higginbotham, and with me as always is Jared Head. And we also have, uh, I, I only call him Space Mike. I realize I called Jared by his first his last name, and uh, oh, Space Mike, you know what, he's just gonna say Space Mike for now, that's just the way it's gonna be. Forever, <laughs> that's okay with me. <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, so, we are trying things a little bit differently. If, if you've been watching us for a while, you may have noticed I typically don't host. Ben will be with us a little bit later on. Uh, he'll. I uh, wrong camera. Awesome. Perfect. Uh, ben will be with us a little bit while later. He'll be uh, giving our or taking our interview a little bit later on with Vector Space. Uh, but first, we want to get into a couple of space news items. And of course, as we always like to start off with a couple of launches. The first one coming up is an H2A launch. Uh, it's a, is it Himawari? How do you pronounce that? Does anybody yeah, know? Yeah, Himawari uh, 9 is the satellite. It's a weather data satellite. So. Perfect. So let's get into uh, a little bit of launching. So this was the uh, Japanese H-2A, uh, which launched on Wednesday, November 2nd at uh, 6.20 Coordinated Universal Time from the uh, Tanagashima Space Center in southern Japan. And like I said, that was the uh, Himawari 9 satellite, which is a weather data satellite for the Japan Meteorological Agency. And uh, this was actually a commercial launch uh, that uh, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries uh, does for that. So uh, I'm very happy for that. And this was just the second launch uh, that Japan has able to successfully do this year. And there's uh, another one planned uh, with uh, the H2 for their uh, HTV cargo vessel later on this year. But uh, very happy for that launch. It's really great that Japan is uh, having these launches. It's really exciting to see uh, more people launching, I feel like, just in general. Yeah. Uh, sort of, I, I was going to say, regardless of what they're launching, I, I, I wear a little bit if they're launching something sketchy, uh, but this sort of thing is really exciting. Um, uh, also really exciting is there's a Long March 5 launch from China. We've got a little bit of footage of that. Almost looked like people in the background there for a second. <laughs> Just birds. It was really cool, though. So this was a uh, launch on November 3rd at 20, uh, 12.43 Coordinated Universal Time from the Wen Chang Space Center in Hainan Island, which is just 13 degrees north of the equator. And this is a brand new rocket. Uh, it's a two-stage rocket with four liquid strap-on boosters that you just saw uh, be jettisoned there. So and the, gorgeous. The thing that's new about this is that it's using liquid oxygen and kerosene as well as liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen instead of the toxic fuels that they've been using, like tetra oxide and hydrazine in the long marches two, three, and four. And with this, it's now going to be in the same class as the Delta IV rocket with a 25-ton uh, payload to uh, low Earth orbit and a 14-ton payload to uh, geosynchronous orbit. That's a big and, rocket. Uh, this, yeah. And the, probably the coolest thing, what you're seeing on screen right there, is their new upper stage, which they're calling YZ-2, which has a multiple reignition capability and is equipped with precision control systems so that it can be a space tug to get payloads to the desired orbit, similar to the hmm. Centaur upper stage. So, oh, I love that uh, they're plotting. That's so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm very happy for China that they were able to successfully uh, do this mission. And with this rocket, they're going to start being able to launch the larger modules that they have planned for their Mir class space station. That's really, really cool. So, uh, so in this particular class of rocket, how many people have this kind of capability? You, you mentioned the Delta IV Heavy. So it's China, the Delta IV Heavy with the Long March 5 Delta IV Heavy. Who else has a rocket this big? 
I suppose that, that Europe comes close with the uh, Ariane 5 rocket. Yeah. Um, and then from there, uh, India has their GSLV Mark III rocket, but it's not fully operational yet because they've only done um, a mission with uh, uh, just the first stage and the boosters of it. They haven't had a full mission with the, the upper stages of it. Hmm. But once they have a fully operational mission of the GSLV Mark III, then that should be within the same class as well. And then, of course, Russia has the Proton rocket that uh, is in the same class class as gotcha. well. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, Space Vogel in the chat room is talking about the rocket cams, the cameras on the rocket themselves, which are always very cool to see. Yes. Those shots are amazing. Uh, and then Citizen Big Number says the contrasting countdown to the Ariane. Uh, yeah, I love that everybody has their own sort of look and feel about all of their launch stuff, like all of the coverage and the cameras on the rocket it's and all stuff unique. like that. Yeah, That's yeah. That's what makes it amazing. It's really, really fun. Uh, so anyway, so we've got a little bit of space news going on, of course, besides just uh, launches, because we do that. Uh, so Jared, you've got an Atlas V called on once again to deliver International Space Station cargo? Yes. So exciting. Once again, Orbital ATK <laughs> is going to be partnering up with the United Launch Alliance to launch Cygnus OA-7 on a flight to the International Space Station. That's awesome. Um, it was just recently announced, and in fact, this is taking advantage of something called uh, the Rapid Launch Program, which United Launch Alliance has just developed. You basically sign a contract, and then you get to launch within four months. So oh. that's a very fast timeline for it there. Now, they are doing this because NASA has sort of requested this uh, to happen, because mm -hmm. SpaceX's Dragon capsule to deliver cargo to the International Space Station is currently grounded. The next H HTV cargo vehicle from the uh, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency has been delayed as well. And a n neat fact about the Atlas V that I didn't realize is that it allows the Cygnus to actually carry an extra ton of cargo to the International Space Station. Oh. So it should be able to allow uh, some extra uh, cargo to sort of relieve the supply chain that's been very strained um, over the past couple of years for the International Space Station. Okay, now, and for really quickly though, for those of us who don't know, because we just had the, the talk about the Long March 5. Yes. It, so, but an Atlas V is still smaller than that? Yes. Is that correct? Yes, it okay. would be. In the just want to make sure. In the configuration that they're going to fly the Atlas V in for the Cygnus, which mm -hmm. has no boosters, yeah. um, it's it will, cannot lift as much as a Long March 5. Okay, but it's still lifting more than it had before. Uh, well, it's lifting more than the current launcher for the Cygnus, which is called Antares. Okay, perfect. I think so, I got it now. There you go. So <laughs> with Antares, you can launch a Cygnus, yeah. but you can't carry, you can only carry about 2,500 kilograms with it. Okay, and, and with an Atlas V, you can do about 3,500 kilograms. That's a much bigger number. Got yes. it. Yes. Much bigger number, I much like more, it. much more supplies, which is better overall. Nice. <laughs> Very cool. Awesome. Uh, so speaking of the International Space Station, uh, Mike, you have a story, right, coming up about a battery swap? That's right. Um, so uh, kind of as a side note to this, um, NASA has discovered uh, the possible causes for some of the leaky uh, uh, suits that, that they've been having, where the water has been leaking up into the suits. And they were able to find out that it was actually because of uh, cross-contamination with cleaning supplies, where they store both the cleaning supplies and the spacesuits in the Leonardo module. So different processes should be able to avoid uh, uh, similar water leaks in the future, which has cleared future spacewalks. Uh, for, to proceed. And the next major spacewalks that are going to be happening, could be anywhere from two to six spacewalks, is to replace the aging battery packs on the solar panels of the International Space Station and replace them with lithium-ion batteries. They're going to do six lithium-ion batteries to replace the uh, nickel-hydrogen power packs. That uh, uh, They're not sure when how, or rather how long those old power packs could last for, but better to replace them with new technology. And uh, with this, those batteries are going to be sent up on uh, the next uh, cargo mission that Japan is going to be sending, uh, the HTV-6, and that is scheduled for launch on uh, December 9th. Uh, from what we've been hearing, that everything's already been loaded and they're just uh, working on some issues with uh, software propulsion on the service module before uh, uh, integrating the full stack and, and hopefully having another successful launch. Really nice. Uh, Matt Clark in the UK, or Matt Clark UK, sorry, I just assumed that you were in the UK, uh, said, how would a cross-contamination cause a leak? Is anybody... So 
With certain cleaning supplies, I guess what's happening is that uh, the different aerosols were getting inside of the, the tubes sure. that normally would suck water uh, and, and have it be filtered through their, their whole kind of undergarments that, that they wear. The whole problem is that there's these certain valves that if they're not um, having the water move around, then they'll just kind of pool up in one spot until it comes back out where it would normally be um, uh, sucked through. So that's why uh, um, there was a problem, I believe this was in 20. 14, where there was a massive amount of water, and it was actually kind of life-threatening to yeah. the Italian astronaut who uh, that happened to. But it happened again earlier this year, back in January, when uh, Tim Copra and Tim Peake were on a spacewalk. Yeah. And it wasn't as much water, but there was enough to, to, to be worried about it. And they sent that spacesuit back on uh, CRS uh, 8 or 9, I believe. I forget which one it was. Sure. But they sent that back on a Dragon capsule so that they could uh, inspect it fully. And they discovered the reason that it was uh, pooling up and, and clogging essentially was because of these aerosols from cleaning supplies. So they're just like, oh, well, as long as we just avoid that uh, contamination, this shouldn't happen again. So. Interesting. All right. Very cool. Mm -hmm. uh, in the meantime, we have some really crazy. This is why we have you, Jared, because I don't understand any of this stuff, man. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> the All title right. of this one is Galactic Merger Exposes Supermassive Black Hole. Yes. Which is also Supermassive Black Hole is a really great song by yeah. uh, Muse. It Go is. on. All right. Well, uh, the <laughs> National Science Foundation actually has a program where they're using a group of radio telescopes that combine together and they're called the Very Long Baseline Array. Okay. Um, and what they're doing is they're looking at merging galaxies to see if they can actually see the supermassive black holes which sit at the center of very massive, uh, very big galaxies okay. um, to see if they can either see them orbiting each other or actually merging together. And you get to do that in the radio frequencies. Is this the like, we don't know what they do situation? Um, like, we, I don't know, sometimes they merge okay. and sometimes they whatever. So one of the fun things that we do, especially in astrophysics, is that we do computer modeling of things. So that means that we run it on supercomputers and we see what happens. Right. And then we look out at nature and we compare what's happening with nature on our computers That's pretty and neat. we see if it matches up how it's supposed to. Sure. So they're doing this survey and they were looking at two galaxies that are merging together about two billion light years away from our Earth and they found that a trail of material was seen leading to a very intense area of activity mm -hmm. um, and in this image that you see right here that plus symbol is over the center of the galaxy so that's the bigger galaxy of the two that merged. And then that circle there is circling the area where there's intense activity. So they realized that what's happening here is that there's an indication that this supermassive black hole's galaxy was actually stripped away from it in the galactic collision. So now this naked black hole uh, is actually leaving its old galaxy behind at 3,200 kilometers per second. Is it looking is for a new home? Really, really fast. It could be looking for a new <laughs> home for all I know. Um, but what's, what's interesting about this is that scientists thought that when this kind of a process happens, that the two supermassive black holes will go into orbit around each other, they'll become a binary system, and then they'll fall in and eventually form an even bigger black hole when they merge. A super, super massive, a massive black super, hole? A super, super massive, massive <laughs> black, black hole hole. So, <laughs> we don't have a name for that yet. So I guess we don't. A black, yeah, black hole, hole sun, sun. says oh Dada, gosh, thank you. Yep, I appreciate going that. Going down the song yeah. route here. So, I, we're old, go this, on. This was just unexpected because <laughs> they expected the two black holes to go in orbit around each other, right. but they didn't. One one stayed where it was at and the other was like, well, I'm out of here. So <laughs> it kind of didn't match up with the models. So now they've got to go back and kind of maybe rethink the physics of what happens to supermassive black holes when galaxies combine with each other. Interesting. Uh, Jim Green, uh, Jim, Green Jim, I can read really, uh, is, is in the chat room is saying, is it headed this way? No, it's not. Okay, that's good. So, and uh, we don't know if <laughs> any black hole that's headed our way, luckily. So. That is insanity. Uh, all right, so one, oh gosh, we have so many, we've talked so much. Um, we'll, we'll do one more, because I, I do find this one really interesting as well. Mike, you've got to talk about a proton medium, I can't even talk, you've got a thing. Let's just yeah, go with you. Um, uh, 
<laughs> International Launch Services, the uh, commercial arm uh, in, in, in Russia that markets the Proton rockets, a couple months ago, back in September, announced two new variants of the Proton rocket, Proton Medium and Proton Light. And essentially, to create that, they would have an extended first stage, and then they would remove the second stage and, and use the third stage as the new second stage. And with this, they would be able to ha have a, a more to medium to heavy class uh, capability instead of just the heavy market. And with this, they've already, uh, just one month after they announced these variants, they also got their first customers. Uh, the first uh, payloads that will be on the, the first launch of this in 2018 is going to be UTELSAT 5 West B, the communications satellite, and then Orbital ATK's MEV1, or Mission Extension Vehicle. And this is something that I'm really excited about because the Mission Extension Vehicle is a robotic spacecraft that would be able to rendezvous with other spacecraft. And they've already announced that they're going to rendezvous with an Intelsat satellite, although they haven't announced which one yet. And with that, they're going to, to not necessarily refuel the satellite. They're just going to be able to, to dock onto a, an existing piece of hardware that they can grapple onto and take over the the you, the propulsion uh, duties for that satellite to be able to extend its life another, you know, they're sh shooting at like anywhere from 5 to 15 years. And it would do all of the different station keeping for those satellites. And even for satellites that might not necessarily uh, be in a good orbit or have, have used up their life and need to go to a graveyard orbit but don't have the fuel to do so, a satellite like this could move uh, dead satellites into graveyard orbits so that a uh, um, geostationary orbit can still be used useful uh, for many, many years in the future. So I'm really excited about this. Not just uh, the new rocket, but also progress on uh, this mission extension vehicle. So I'm really looking forward to that in 2018. Yeah, God, so much stuff to look forward to. And uh, just as an honorable mention really quickly, Curiosity found some meteorite on Mars that we are a little unsure of, so that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. And the Soyuz crew return home uh, from, I was going to say from Earth. They return home to Earth, so that's a really good thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's awesome to have uh, some of our people back, and we are always learning more and more. So we're going to take a little bit of a break, and when we come back, Ben Higginbotham is going to be joining us, and he's going to be interviewing Jim Cantrell from Vector Space Systems. So stay with us. We'll be right back. And welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get started with the show, I did want to give a quick notice, actually, to everyone. Uh, tomorrow is a worldwide show, and as such, we have chosen a worldwide time standard, which is Coordinated Universal Time. This show is always at 1800 hours, Coordinated Universal Time, at 6 o'clock p.m. UTC. And UTC does not honor daylight saving, and neither do we, which means if you are in a European time zone, you've probably already set your clock back, which means this show is at a different time. For those of you in the United States, tomorrow you're going to be setting your clock back, which means if you change your clock, this show's time changes with it. So it will be one hour earlier for those people who change their clock. Not, nifty little factoid, not everyone changes their clock. So if you're in an area that does not change your clock, the show time for this show does not change for you. So again, always 1800 coordinated universal time for a good chunk of the United States that will actually be adjusting for you unless you're in what, Arizona, areas on the East Coast. So, uh, all right. I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who have contributed $10 or more to the show. We've also got our Patreon producers. These are people who have contributed $5 or more. They get free worldwide swag, store shipping, and of course the premium members get the access to the Slack channel. To find out more information on how you can help crowdfund the shows of the tomorrow, head out over to patreon.com slash tmro. All right, we are joined by the CEO of Vector Space Systems, uh, Jim Cantrell. Jim, thank you so much for taking time out of your Saturday to join us. Yeah, you're quite welcome. Uh, so we, you know, we're space nerds. We've heard a lot of space companies, but Vector, that's not one that we talk about too much. You guys are fairly new on the scene. Tell us a little bit about who Vector is. Well, so Vector is uh, the company that's uh, putting together 
uh, a set of technologies that are really designed to, as we like to say, democratize space by lowering the barriers to getting there. And uh, I'll get into a little bit of, of what those are, but basically the, the problem with uh, space exploration over the past uh, 50 years has been it's been very expensive and very time consuming to get there. You mentioned earlier that ULA was offering this, this uh, rapid launch capability. Uh, that's, that's a really big part of the problem. That's where we're starting is this whole business of, of actually getting assets to orbit. And uh, so with that, we're, we're building a uh, launch vehicle system, which we call the Vector R and the Vector H, two different vehicles, basically the same family, uh, to focus on the microsat community. And then the uh, second part of our business plan is to uh, place our own constellation of satellites uh, in, in orbit that allow people then to essentially escape this whole business of, of building the satellites and launching them and be able to directly access them and put their own apps directly on our satellites, much like you do on, on cell phones. So that, that's the innovation model that we think is going to play into the next century, where people are uh, you know, not having to put out $10, 100000000 million and wait four years to get, get their ideas in space. So let's talk about the launcher let's for talk a moment. About the launcher. Uh, we, you've got uh, you know SpaceX r r focusing on reusability. We've got Electron Rocket, who's focusing on just rapid production of the rocket. Uh, what ki what kind of camp are you guys in in the reusability or rapid low cost production? Well, so it's interesting. Both SpaceX and uh, Rocket Labs uh, personally had things to do with. I was one of the on the founding team of SpaceX, and uh, you know their model is is interesting in the sense that. What Elon's doing and they're doing as a whole company is is paying for their capability to get to Mars on the geostationary market. And when uh, one of the other Vector founders, John Garvey, and I uh, were, were working with Elon in the early days, we urged him to start with a small vehicle because it's easier to build, it's less costly. And, and you know, at the point that that was in 2002, the market wasn't really there for the microsats. But... What, what SpaceX has, has decided as a business decision is to chase the geostationary market to go after those mature revenues and at the same time developing a capability uh, that allows them to exploit that technology to go to Mars. It was clear from the beginning that that was what Elon wanted to do, and we're starting to see that. For 10 years, people thought I was crazy when I told them that the goal of SpaceX was to go to Mars, but now we're starting to see that I, I wasn't so crazy. Uh, Rocket Lab... Um, is, is more in our camp. They uh, started with the idea of, of mass production of the rockets. When they started, it was several years earlier than us. And what uh, they ended up doing was sizing their vehicle so it's a little bit bigger. They're about three times, five, no, sorry, four times the size of our Vector uh, R and about twice as big as our Vector H. And uh, so that was because that's where the market was, was really active at that point. What we're seeing is the market for the satellites is getting smaller and smaller over time. And uh, there's more and more of the smaller ones there. And nobody's really serving that market. And so that's what we set out to do as a start is to, is to build that original, we joke it's the Falcon Zero, uh, that small vehicle that we, we tried to talk Elon into building in the beginning. And so what we're doing is building a vehicle that, that can be mass produced truly on 100, 200 a year and, uh, and hopefully launched at 100 to 200 a year uh, so that we can get the, the service to the Microsat community, something that's specialized. We're finding our customers like owning the entire shroud of the launch vehicle, uh, whether that's a big, big vehicle or small one, that's a, that's a, that's a very key uh, factor in, in their choosing of launch vehicles. So uh, what we're finding so far, when we signed up about five customers, totaling about 100 launches, uh, is the thing that's really brought them to us is their ability to own the shroud environment, which you really can't do with the uh, rocket labs because you end up putting more vehicles, more satellites on a single launch, and then that's a risk profile issue. So pound per pound to, to orbit, we're about the same cost as rocket labs. We're quite a bit more than uh, SpaceX because as the vehicles get larger, the cost to go to orbit uh, goes down. But it's, it's, it's like everything else in life. Very few economic decisions are made on, you know, the cost per pound of, of the things you buy in the store or, or, you know, homes, you know, the cost per square foot. Uh, what we really find is the price point is driving uh, the customers to uh, look at uh, uh, buying something that meets their, their needs and they can own the shroud. So the big differentiator for you is that actually you're quite a bit smaller. 
Uh, so that allows you as a customer, because we're seeing the satellite market, as we were talking about in these last few weeks, the satellites are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And now we're at small sats, nano sats, and pico sats. So uh, you actually have a launcher where I can, if I have a nano sat, and I don't want to have to wait to be a secondary payload on something else, I can just buy your rocket. And because the rocket is smaller, it costs less. There's not as much stuff that has to go into it. It's a lot easier from a ground system standpoint. That's, that's the main differentiator here. That, that's that yeah that's getting down into the technical weeds but that's really what makes us technically different we're very small it's about a 45 foot tall rocket for the vector r it weighs uh you know about 5,000 kilograms wet and uh, it's launched literally off the back of a trailer so we have a mobile launch system where it launches off of a, of a concrete pad and uh it's very simple uh the, the fueling's all liquid so uh you can uh you can you can uh, launch it pretty much from anywhere. The, the explosive siding requirements are fairly minimal. You can see here where it's uh, going through uh, Tucson. This is exactly uh, illustrates our point. Not everybody can drag a uh, rocket behind their one-ton Dodge truck, and uh, you can see how how literally small the vehicle is. The blue strong back there is what lifts the vehicle up. You can see part of the uh, uh, the, the launch pad uh, structure on the back of the rocket there. And, uh, you know, we don't have to have the huge $100 million infrastructure to launch from. And if we have a bad day like SpaceX had, uh, it's a matter of getting the bulldozer out and, you know, clearing it off and starting all over with a new pad. So, you know, everything's built to be mass produced. Everything's built to be launched easily. We're thinking the whole problem through really from a manufacturing and operations point of view. One of the things that allowed us to do that and make it going so quickly is we, we acquired Garvey Spacecraft Corporation uh, when, we, when we began Vector, and they've been in business for 15 years. So we have an unfair advantage in that we have a head start. They developed all the propulsion, the proprietary fuels, and so forth that uh, has really got us very rapidly at this point. Our first launch of the Vector R is going to be the end of next year, about 12 months from today. And what about reusability? Is that something that you're going to try to reuse the rockets, or are they just small enough where it doesn't make sense, you just take it and throw it away? Uh, no, we'll, we'll reuse the vehicles. Um, they, to date, you know, Garvey has flown 30 of these flights. We've, we've flown one, and uh, they've all been reused. And it's sort of an ironic uh, uh, circumstance. That everybody makes a big deal out of reusability. We did it out of economics just because we didn't see a reason to replace the engines. And uh, so we've uh, demonstrated the vehicle itself is reusable, even with the composite tanks. They're pretty durable on a parachute landing scenario. Our, our intent is to have an aerial recovery uh, rather than a flyback of this booster so that the uh, first stage comes back and we can recover at the very least the engines and the uh, composite uh, tanks, which are you know a good portion of the cost of, of each vehicle. Uh, so to Wicked in the chat room asks, uh, the website doesn't really clarify, are the vehicles reusable uh, launch, land, launch, or are they refurbish refurbishable launch, land, fix, launch? Yeah, the reason we're hedging our bets on that is because w we don't know for certain whether they'll be just plainly reusable like SpaceX uh, is, is looking like they're going to say. We think they will be, uh, but until we get a little more experience with it, we really don't know. Uh, uh, ideally, you know, we could take them, clean them out, put them back on the launch pad. We do have some service items on the engines themselves that are a little different than SpaceX. We'll probably uh, swap out an engine pack and send the engine pack back to the factory to be rebuilt. Uh, the, the nozzles themselves are ablatively cooled. So you know, once we get a little more experience in the flight and know how the ablatively cooled nozzles uh, disfigure with time, you know, we'll know whether or not we need to service that. We know the injectors, for example, are all fine. We know all the valving and all that works fine. Uh, so it's really going to be a question of how we how we see how this operates, and that's a that's a down the road capability uh, that uh, we haven't factored into our pricing. But uh, down the road, once we can demonstrate this capability and, and get comfortable with it, you know, it can help our pricing quite a bit. Which brings up the next question: You say uh, down the road, how long out until you think you'll start uh, launching some of these nanosats? So our first launch with a paying customer is scheduled for early 2018. We have our what we call our Block Zero vehicles going to launch in the end of 2017, and that's what we're currently working on is to get that uh, going. It's uh, uh, very close to what you saw there uh, in, in the uh, videos you were showing, uh, except uh, that's an engineering model made out of aluminum. This, this uh, Block Zero will be an all-composite vehicle, 
and uh, we'll launch it out of Kodiak, Alaska, and uh, it'll be proving you know all the all the major orbital systems. We probably won't have a satellite on that one. The Block Ones will start launching in 2018, and we have people who are so enthusiastic about getting to space who've bought our first three test vehicles from the Block One series. Uh, so uh, we've we've uh, you know given them some uh, you know advantage pricing for that. But uh, we'll be flying uh, either our satellites or customer satellites on on the first three. We we like to say we'll be in uh, full operational uh, uh, situation by the end of 2018. And uh, like I said earlier, we sold almost 100 of these launches. So the the Vector H, which is a bit heavier than this, it's a it's a about uh, 50 feet foot tall. Will launch on the same uh, basic platform, the Mobile Tell. Uh, has five uh, first stage engines instead of three like the the R does, and slightly longer tanks, and it's got a full diameter second stage, same second stage engine, same avionics. It's basically the same same vehicle with bigger tanks and, and more first stage engines. That one uh, we're looking at the Block Zero launch being in 2019, early 2019, and being in service probably mid 2019. Uh, Mini Storage has an inter inter interesting question, which is why fly from Alaska? Well, so one of the uh, high demand orbits is is polar, sun synchronous or just plain polar or high inclinations. You can do that out of uh, Cape Canaveral uh, because you'd be flying over land and that's that's more of a policy issue than anything else. I think the highest you can get out of uh, Cape Canaveral is about 57 degrees, something on that order. So uh, Alaska has a commercial uh, launch range, uh, the Pacific Spaceport. Uh, Alaska uh, is, I think, the official name of it. We always called it Kodiak. And uh, they have launched into orbit out of there a number of times. They've been doing a lot of uh, suborbital launches for a uh, missile defense agency and so on. Uh, they're, they're good folks to work with. And, uh, you know, it's a little logistically difficult to get there. But, you know, we don't have overflight concerns. It, the, the whole safety uh, regulations with respect to the FAA are easier to deal with. And so what we're what we're planning on doing is is uh, both cutting our teeth there, uh, plus servicing our, our our high inclination orbital customers there, and uh, you know being that it's not a uh, a majorly busy uh, spaceport right now, you know the idea of being able to launch fifty to one hundred a year uh, works very well out of a, a place like that. So you mentioned you had five co customers covering over hundred launches. Uh, are you allowed to say uh, Phelps is asking who are some of those customers? Sure. Uh, I think all but uh, one of them I can mention. Um, well, actually, two by name. I can give you some generalities uh, just because we haven't agreed on the press releases yet. So our first customer was ISI, and they're a Finnish radar satellite company, and they're building microsats uh, to uh, use SAR radar imaging uh, to look at all of the various shipping uh, uh, activity all over the world, ice flows, uh, environmental kinds of imaging. So uh, if, if you are familiar with that particular world, SAR imaging is a very popular uh, uh, data and it's very expensive. And so these guys are building uh, a constellation of uh, about 100 uh, SAR satellites over over time. Uh, we've got a, a, a contract with them for 21 of those satellite launches. Their first one is going to launch at the end of next year on a Falcon 9, but they're caught up in this Falcon 9 uh, uh, failure investigation. The chances are uh, that we may actually beat those guys to orbit, depending on how things fall out for them. Uh, but uh, the rest of them, they've contracted with us. The second one uh, that's out there is York Space Systems. And York is, a, is an interesting company that builds microsatellites, uh, primarily uh, as, as a, a sort of a turnkey solution for payloads. And uh, they've, they've purchased a combination of uh, the Vector R's and the Vector H's based on uh, some of the customers they're working with. And I don't actually know who their end customers are at this point, um, but uh, I know they've got a couple of them sold early on, so that's more of a, of a bulk buy with some options on it. Um, the third one is Planet IQ, who's looking at uh, weather satellites for uh, uh, the, the global coverage of the Earth. And so what Planet IQ uses is the GPS signals, and as, as the signal passes between the GPS satellite and the Planet IQ satellite, it goes down through the Earth's atmosphere, and so it provides a, a sounding of the atmosphere uh, all over the, the Earth 24-7. Uh, so essentially, if you want to think of the Earth as a grid of, of knowns and unknown uh, you know, atmospheric uh, temperatures and profiles, what they'll do is, is densify that grid of known 
known uh, profiles, and so they're going to build uh, upwards of 100 satellite and uh, fly them, and we'll fly them three at a time on our Vector R's. And uh, they've got a second generation satellite, they're looking at a Vector H. And so we have, a, have two more uh, constellations, one's an imaging constellation that's looking at this, and then another one uh, which is, uh, is not going to orbit the Earth, it's going to go beyond Earth. And so I can't mention their name yet, but we just signed the contract uh, last week, and that'll be one of our very early launches. So. Uh, stand by watch for the uh, press release on that. That'll be very interesting. That actually sounds really cool, uh, which brings up an interesting qu question from Anno Nim, which is, uh, will there be live launch coverage of these? Yeah, so what we want to do is to have as much public engagement in what, what we're doing as possible. And, uh, you know, when we say we want to democratize space, we really mean it because this this is where the innovation is. It's, it's not at the government agencies. It's not in the big companies at the individual level. So, you know, part of our mission is, is to broaden the, uh, the DNA uh, pool, if you will, of people who are really, truly doing stuff in space. And, and most of us who got interested in space got there because we had some experience where, you know, we're, we, we saw some activity. We, we had almost a religious experience watching a rocket or something of that nature. You know, I myself never intended to get into the space business, uh, but I, uh, I got involved back in the 1980s when I was in college because I saw a sign in the hallway for a design course taught by NASA to design a Mars rover. And uh, so I ended up actually working for the French Space Agency on a joint French-Soviet Mars program because I followed my nose on that. And, and I was going to go in the automotive industry. I would have never done it. So the long way to answer the question, yes, we, we want to get as much public engagement of, of what we're doing as possible. Uh, it's going to take us a little while to get the uh, infrastructure together, but... Uh, uh, you know, in Alaska, it's going to be a little tougher. We have uh, a deal signed for Launch Complex 46 out in uh, Cape Canaveral for operations out of there through Space Florida. And uh, we're working with the Kennedy Space Center uh, 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 Visitor Center uh, to work with them to engage the public on uh, tours and so forth of our operations. So we're still working all those details out. I probably shouldn't go into too much detail, but... Uh, you know, we definitely see the public interest in this stuff as a very important part of what we're doing. So you mentioned you were kind of uh, doing some space stuff in the 80s, which means you had an opportunity to see, um, we'll call it New Space 1.0 kind of come and go, and a lot of people forgot about that era of like Beale Aerospace and things like that. Does that scare you that there was this kind of bubble of New Space? We had people trying to buy the Mir space station and build their own vehicles, and they all disappeared and we were left with the general like Boeing and Lockheed's, and now we've got New Space 2.0 coming along. Do you think there's going to be a repeat of, of that, or is it a totally different market now? Yeah, you know, it's, it's completely different. Let, let me sort of suggest to you also, maybe, maybe I'll call it New Space 0.0, uh, but there was a whole bunch of activity that I was personally involved with that, that happened a long time before New Space. I mean, obviously, commercial space has been around for a long time, you know, with the commercial commsats, um, what what really sort of started the modern space era uh, in new in new space, as everybody calls. It. I've I've gone on record saying I don't like that term, but okay, fine. We'll, we'll, live well with what, it. what term would you use? Uh, is there a better term? Uh, I would say it's entrepreneurial space. So it's it's non-government space. And you could call it commercial space. Uh, I mean, really, what we're seeing now today is investor funded. Uh, where it's where it's done by more entrepreneurs than big companies. So looking at things that are uh, possible with smaller dollars, and that that's what uh, I th find interesting. So w let me just go back as far as history, if you've got a moment. Um, when when we first did this mission to Mars, I actually did it through the Planetary Society, and that was citizen funded space. Now, if you look at the Planetary Society, which was founded by Carl Sagan and Lou Friedman and Bruce Murray. They were all frustrated with the lack of progress that NASA was making. This was post-Viking, and where NASA seemed to be shutting down, and so on. And they formed the Planetary Society to advocate citizen space. And what that ended up being, and I was really one of the first people that did it, was they people, people that were Planetary Society members believed so much in making things happen, even if it wasn't our own government, uh, that we gathered up citizen funds, and I went to France on that money. And so my involvement in this Mars mission was funded by individual donations. And uh, it, was, it was something that our government would never do because it involved the Soviet Union. And that's back when the Soviet Union still existed with France. And so we made a real honest con contribution to that with citizen funding. 
And then uh, what what's came after that, though, is the Beals and all these these other things that happened about 2000, about the time SpaceX started, by the way. And that happened, that, that all fell apart, in my opinion, because the capital expenditures were too, too high. There was a, a few companies that survived that. Iridium's one of them, but they barely survived it. They went bankrupt and they almost took Motorola with them. And then when somebody finally bought them for $50 million and recapitalized, it's a very profitable business. I think our modern era is much better off because what we see is a lowering of the cost of capital to get there. And that's the whole point of Vector is we want to see that continue. And our idea is taking what, what today is arguably a $20, $30 million kind of expenditure to get your constellation or your, you know, your business in space in four years. We want to transform that to single digit million dollars in weeks or months so that, that you know, literally the people in the basement with their computer can come up with the idea, write the software for it, and then demonstrate on our, on our cloud that it will work, and then go find the, the, the money for it, uh, whether it's VCs, investors, or you know, family and friends that invest in it, and they can upload this to our constellation and it works. That, that's where the real innovation will come. And if we can get the capital and the time down to that level, we can ensure that, that this will not only become a trillion dollar industry, but it will draw the best minds to this business. And that's really why I'm doing this. Uh, you know, the rocket part is easy. The hard part is making this thing sustain itself. And uh, we really want to change the space industry the way that Apple changed the computer industry. It went from a, an industry where it was specialists who could use, you had to go to college to use a computer and all that sort of thing, to where my 80-year-old my mother was using her Mac uh, up until the day she died. And, uh, you know, that's a fundamental change. That's a fundamental change in taking the power of this technology and putting it into the hands of the people. And it does enormous good for the world, too. It's not just a, something that's for the technical elite. It, it's something that allows the world to advance. You think about uh, how, how differently things happen geopolitically today with things like Facebook and Twitter and, and this, this, this instant news everywhere. And, and, you know, here we are doing a television broadcast on the Internet, and I'm, I'm in, you know, my office in the backyard of my home. And it's, it's a major revolution in how things are done. And uh, we want to continue that. We want to make that whole model transform into space. And we think that uh, we don't even know, uh, as we sit here today as Vector, we don't know what people are going to do with it. But we know if we give them the tools to do it, that that innovation will follow. So you talk about an entire space economy. It seems like uh, hearing you talk, you've kind of got the launchers as phase one, lowering the cost of getting things to space. And then phase two, mm -hmm. kind of low cost constellations in space. Is there phase three? What's, what's beyond that? Well, phase three is really just uh, putting together the virtual machine technology that uh, enables these, these people to uh, put their software onto our, our satellites and, and to develop that that capability that operates on, on the satellite. So by the time we get there, no, there's no, no phase four after that. But this, this turning the whole space problem into one of software that, you know, I'm, I'm too old to be doing a startup, I guess. I'm in my 50s. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I started programming on, on card readers. And, you know, my kids today, I've, I've got a 15-year-old as my youngest, and they can make computers turn on their, on their head. And, uh, you know, what we want to do ultimately and our, and our success will be had when, you know, even kids can put together space apps and put them up there and run them on our constellations. That we will consider our job done. Uh, that sounds pretty awesome. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very excited for that. All right, uh, I did want to end on a couple of uh, interesting questions that we're trying to start to ask all of our guests. And these can be really quick, short, one answer type of things uh, or, or as long as you want them to be. Uh, so the first one is uh, Moon or Mars first? <laughs> Mars, of course. Uh, liquid or solids? Oh, liquids, always. Always liquids, interesting. All right. Always. Uh, uh, what should the name of the first vehicle uh, sending humans to Mars be? Uh, Apollo. Apollo. Uh, when do you think humans will set foot on the moon again? I don't think that'll be till 2030. 2030 for the moon, and when will they set foot on Mars? I, I will go on the limb and predict that Elon will be there by 2025. Oh, so we'll go to Mars before we go to the moon. Of course, you were Mars first, so, uh, yep. Uh, and why space? Space is a unique perspective that, uh, that, that gives humanity the ability to see the world as a whole, that there's no other way to do it. 
Uh, you could think of it as a as a cell phone tower in the sky that doesn't need permitting, but it's really it's about more than that. It gives us a view of ourselves. This is our fragile little blue planet, and uh, that's why we go there. There's something that draws us there. All right. Thank you so much for your time. Where can people go for more information on yourself or Vector Space Systems? Yeah, VectorSpaceSystems.com. And if you want to know more about me personally, JimCantrell.com. And you'll read a lot about racing there. <laughs> awesome. Jim, thank you so much for taking time out of your Saturday. Uh, we're going to take yep. a quick break. When we come back, comments from last week's show. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. We've always looked to the stars. They guide us, give us comfort, help us find our way. We see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. And we long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So, we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man. The exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. Many think we stopped exploring. But we know our journey didn't end. We've only just begun. Orion is functioning perfectly at this point. Come with us and explore tomorrow. Welcome back, and one more reminder, because everyone gets screwed up this time of year. Uh, we are changing time zones worldwide, so for those of you in Europe who've already changed your clocks back, the show is already a different time. It's an hour earlier for you. For those of you in the United States, we'll be changing your time soon. Uh, if you are changing your clock, the, show, the time of the live show will be changing for you also. It'll be an hour earlier. If you do not change your clock, the time of the show does not change. This show is always 1800 Coordinated Universal Time. All right, I want to give a huge shout out to all the patrons of tomorrow who've helped to make this specific, specific segment easy for me to say. Uh, if this episode happened, blah, 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 let's get all the words out. These are the people who've uh, contributed $10 or more. They are premier members. are going to get access to our Slack channel. We've also got our producers. These are people who have contributed $5 or more. They get free worldwide sh uh, shipping on our swag store uh, and a bunch of other things. We also have our Patreon Plus subscribers. They're going to get access to After Dark Early. They're $2.50 or more. Uh, they get a bunch of other uh, rewards as well, such as uh, hangouts when we have those uh, approximately quarterly or so. And we've also got our patrons. These are between $1 and $2.49. Uh, they're going to get your name in the show and, of course, those Google Hangouts as well. Thank you to all of the patrons for make, help make all of this happen. We actually have some uh, behind-the-scenes shots, so uh, your patronage goes to making this show better, and this is some of what it does. Uh, we've actually got a shot. This is us getting new wood for this was this last, uh, <laughs> yep, yep, that's Jared working hard. Jared yep. and Dutta working hard. Uh, that actually gets heavy after a while. It is. Yeah, and uh, we also have um, many sheets of MDF. Uh, what's interesting is um, we chose MDF because it is one of Dutta's favorite substances to work with. I did not know that. No. Uh, so he's actually requested that a good no. chunk of additional items be made out of MDF. No, thank you. Uh, we call this he's the... He's uh, laughing wildly. You guys can't hear him, but <laughs> Dutta is, is close to cursing Ben out right now. <laughs> uh, what you're seeing is the sawdust... The like the dust from like one or two cuts of MDF. We're calling it our Martian regolith. It is, let me tell you, all over the studio. It is coating 
everything, absolutely everything. We painted one of these walls black. It is now basically that brown color again. Uh, and then we also, I wanted to show you something that we haven't purchased yet. This is kind of cool. We've been going back and forth and back and forth. Uh, for those of you in the Slack channel, you've already seen this, but these are the new interview chairs that we'll be getting. Uh, these are kind of neat. They're way more expensive than they should be, but I think they look kind of cool. We don't really like the base, the pedestal, like the feet I'm not, we're not huge fans of, so we may custom build something there. But Let's make it out of MDF. We are definitely making it out. You know what? I don't think we need to buy that chair. We'll just build a chair out of MDF. It'll be, it'll be so fast because <sighs> you'll sit in it and it will just crumble into dust and it'll be nice and soft. It'll be great. Or, or we could just bag the regolith into, into bags and that can be the cushions. <laughs> it's so messy, guys. It is so messy. It is, oh it is the worst thing to work with. So for, for those of you who are Premier members, oh. um, if, you, if you haven't accepted that Slack invite, go check your email again. Go accept that Slack invite because you get like, like a good chunk of these pictures, um, Dutta, uh, cursing at me when I'm talking about MDF, which yes. is hilarious. Uh, <laughs> and then you also have other, a lot more behind the scenes photos <laughs> of us actually building this thing. Uh, actually in there, you have the full CAD drawings of what all of it's going yeah. to look like. That is only available to our premier members. Now our other patrons have had little glimpses inside. They've actually had access to some other pictures uh, and a really cool time-lapse video that's only available to our patrons. Actually, I believe all patron levels got access to that uh, time-lapse. It kind of trickles down, right? So you're, you get it sooner with your different reward levels. Uh, so anyhow, it, I, again, thank you to all of our patrons who are enabling us to do these really cool things. So yeah, this yes. is our temporary set. It's it's kind of, it is what it is right now, but I'll tell you by Orbit 10 next year, this is all going to be fantastic. And we keep playing with the show format a little bit. Uh, you noti you'll notice us doing that week after week to try to really get it honed in for Orbit 10. All right, let's go ahead and get started for our comments from our last week's show, which was uh, Small Sats with Vax. I like that title. That was a fun one. <laughs> it's like a children's show. Yeah. Well, then I was definitely one who came up with that title. <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right, Capcom, take us away. <laughs> this first comment comes from side right. Zach Wadex says, uh, admit it. You're just glad you don't have to pronounce Schiaparelli anymore. Schiaparelli. 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 I, we, I think we've pronounced it All every single way ways. in this show. Probably in the same show. Yeah, even. Probably. Schiaparelli. Uh, yeah, I'm not gonna lie. I'm, I, we, we do, we do trip over some of these a lot. And then every. Uh, Train. And then, yeah, I thought it was an earthquake for a second. The whole, <laughs> you probably can't hear it because we have high pass filters on everything that allows the high frequencies through and it cuts out the low frequencies. But there is a train track like 100 feet away from this building. And that train was large enough that the whole table shook. It was all sorts of awesome. All right, anyhow, moving on. Everyone's like, why are you talking about things we can't perceive on camera? Just ignore mm. it. Okay, moving on. I did. So next comment comes off of YouTube. Kind of comes from Ryan Duncan. It says, uh, I think CubeSat with a descent camera and CPU system with an electromagnet powered by either radioactive degradation or even solar uh, uh, could, could work, couldn't it? I envision the CPU would set a position in a spot where the field cancels itself out. So wh I, what's this in reference to? I have no idea, but it was put in Not there, and so I read it. If only Vax was he here to answer this question. If only Vax was here to answer this question. <laughs> oh. Mm. This is, uh, he, Vax says, rad hardening equipment to make small sats last Vax longer. Vax didn't say that. Dutta said it, but I'm sorry. keep going. What? Yes. Someone, someone <laughs> said that, and I heard it in my ear. A voice. That you guys weren't here. I heard voices in my head right. that you didn't hear. Um, oh, uh, so uh, with a decent camera... Yeah, I mean, and actually, if you have a decent enough EM shield around, that's what our magnetosphere is, essentially. We have a right. giant electromagnetic yes. magnetic shield around the Earth. If you can build a big enough one around your small set, that would that would do it too. Although, yeah. I'm not sure we have to rad harden it that much. I mean, a little bit, but just let the radiation rip through it and just have enough where it can deal with it. Yeah, Although, you can do that too. Although, CMOS sensors don't, uh, sensors don't. CCD sensors really hate radiation. You can actually watch the radiation just rip through and destroy the pixels. CMOS is a little uh, a little better with that. But uh, yeah, interesting. Yeah, you could probably pull that off. Cool. Okay, next up. All right, next one comes up uh, also off of YouTube. So it comes from Gonzo, Gonzo God 75 I can say things. Uh, we, all, we all need easily understood people like Vax Hedrum. Yes. Just because I might yes. know what's happening with cute sets doesn't mean that Joe and Jane Citizen do. So thanks, Emery. I agree. All right, I think that's why we have everyone kind of here, right? You're able yeah. to make uh, nerdy, constellation-y stuff easy to understand, yeah. nerd. Super and you're able to make nerdy hole. rocketry stuff easy to understand, nerd. 
Right? So, I mean, there's everyone, <laughs> nerds. Well, yeah, when I wanted to you know like, what dorks. the difference was between the different rockets, because yeah. I'm just calling something a five doesn't inherently mean anything to me. I'm sorry. It could sorry. actually be smaller. Oh, like, yeah. Five could be, like, smaller I'm gonna than start, the yeah. yeah, and I can't call it a Delta V, because that's a totally different thing. It's super annoying. <laughs> it's not a Delta V. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's a Delta Five. I get it. I know. It's it's super annoying, Delta though. Delta V. Uh, Delta Four? Just and, saying. Yes, we, five? we like Vax a lot. Uh, not only is he great with like the Northrop Grumman stuff uh, mm -hmm. and doing all of that, um, his Sea Dragon interview was all sorts of epic. And if you guys haven't yeah. seen the Sea Dragon interview, definitely go back. That is one of my favorite episodes because it is, it's a little nerdy, not gonna, not gonna, it, it's, it's a little nerdy, but it's, the Sea Dragon project was so beautiful in its simplicity. No turbo pumps. No big, huge. It's not about being making the most efficient engine. In fact, it's pretty much what's the opposite of the most efficient engine. That, I guess we call that Sea Dragon. Uh, it's just a, inefficient. In, it's super inefficient, <laughs> but it's so large, it's so massive, it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, so Dud is saying in my head that there were several comments asking for a, re a redo between. I mean, I don't have to do the last comment. Does everyone else want to take my words away from me? You guys suck a whole lot right oh, now. Oh yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Dada. yeah. Is that what's going on? Yeah, Dada. All right. So last comment comes off of YouTube from one J Val ninety. Thank what? you, hey, Jay, hey, for hey, this Car comment. Hey, Carrie. Because apparently <laughs> everybody else agrees with you. Hey, hey Carrie, what's J Val ninety say? I want to see an episode about the Sea Dragon versus SpaceX BFR. Include the point that rockets seem to scale less on literally once than they get above a certain size. <laughs> well done. Thanks. Well done. Because that's, that's that. That's In any case, uh, I, I did mean a Delta <laughs> Four, not a Delta V. Sorry. That was a, my IV joke. That didn't go over well. <laughs> yeah, no, I got, I got it. I understood I what you were saying. I know most people understood, but some people didn't understand, and I felt like I needed to explain. So, yeah, there you, you, go. You, you were saying, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, it made yeah. sense. If you didn't get it, go back. It was, she was joking. Sorry. Get it's it fine. Screen, it doesn't right? matter. So, yeah. everyone wants to see a Sea Dragon SpaceX confused. BFR episode. Awesome. Want to know why? Because Vax was awesome. Yeah, you, yes. know, you know what we should do? We should fly Vax here. Uh, in Orbit 10 and put him on studio, like in set. I think that would be a really great... Can we just uh, put him in the corner, though? And just in the corner? Just, I don't know, like Skype him from the next room? Well, that would be a little hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> like, fly him all the way out here and then have him Skype. Oh, he like, could Skype from in from our house. To, yeah. Like, no, no, from like 10 feet away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. have, him behind, have him behind the set. Wow. Yeah, but I can't say that reference. No one knows what it looks like. Yeah, all right. Yeah, Anyhow. Yeah. From behind the set. Donna made it funny, but uh, you have no point of contact, so there you go. I tar redacted. I tar redacted. All right, that's our show this week. Uh, <laughs> thank you all so much. Uh, curious to what you guys thought of the news segment. Uh, how did that flow for you? Did you like it better than what we've been doing the last two weeks? Uh, we're kind of trying an on-off thing to try to get the news uh, um, better i think uh i'll you know i'll talk about it after dark and my yes. thought process on that so all right that's our show for this week uh thank you so much and we'll see you next week